and tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Welcome back, friend. It's National Comic Sans Day on Drew Blood's Dark Tales, a day when we celebrate more than just a childish font, but our deep-seated spirit of rebellion. And to all you polished, coiffed, and buttoned-up elitists who bend your eyebrows at anything less than Times New Roman, we say to you on this day, go fuck yourselves. Well said, Chester. Always trying to one-up me, aren't you? Come on in, friend. We got work to do. Hmm. All right. So smoke them if you got them and drink those glasses to the bottom, y'all. Because old Drew Blood has a tale to tell. This episode of Drew Blood's Dark Tales is brought to you by BetterHelp. Have you ever felt like you were at a crossroads, friends? Like whatever decision you make next could affect everything moving forward? These moments happen in everyone's lives, and when they do, you'd better have a pretty good view of the path in front of you. Whether you're dealing with decisions around career, relationships, or anything else, therapy helps you keep focused on what you really want out of life, so you can move forward with confidence and excitement. Trusting yourself to make decisions that align with your values is like anything. The more you practice it, the easier it gets. So let therapy be your map with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash DarkTales today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash DarkTales. Oh, hey, I didn't see you there. You know, Drew Blood's Dark Tales is only one of the many shows on this network you could be listening to. We hope you'll subscribe to our entire lineup, including Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, Scary Stories Told in the Dark, Fear from the Heartland, and Horror Hill. All available on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform. Also, visit simplyscarypodcast.com to become a patron. For as little as $5 a month, you get our entire catalog ad-free and available to download or stream. A bargain. And now, back to the show. So tonight we welcome back Frederick Pangborn, whom you might remember from past episodes Dead Storage, Where the Ravenous Dwell, The Ninth Circle, and most recently Death's Garden. In this story, we join George Hart, a New Yorker with a bit of a bug problem. So without further delay, I give you Open Windows. My name is George Hart, and I'm a true native New Yorker, born and raised in the Great Empire State. My mother, Maria, gave birth to me right here in the Bronx, over at the Lincoln Medical Center. I was told it was during a record cold spell on a frigid February morning back in 38. I grew up in the South Bronx in one of those old five-story apartment buildings right off Lafayette Avenue. One of those decrepit-looking brick-faced apartment buildings that are practically erected right on top of each other. Like the ones on television, where the guys are running from building to building on the rooftops and leaping off to the next roof in a single bound. I always hated having all those buildings built so close to each other. So close that the residents could run a clothesline from their window to the building next door, cramming as much living space as possible into that one block. 
Yet, here I am again. My mother recently passed away two months after my 43rd birthday. I got the call up at work. I was working at a buddy's garage up in Yonkers at the time. The police told me it looked as if she had had a heart attack. Died in her sleep. Never knew mom as having a bad ticker, but shit happens as they say. After the funeral, I decided to head back to the Bronx from Yonkers and move into our old apartment. The rent was a lot cheaper, and Raymond, whose garage I was working at, had made a phone call and gotten me a job at a garage that was only a few blocks away from the old place near Randall Avenue. The Lord taketh away, and he giveth. The apartment was on the third floor of five and faced the street out front. I left most of the things in the apartment the way they were when I moved back in. Even left Mom's room the way it was. I felt bad just at the thought of getting rid of any of her stuff, so I left her room be. I wound up settling into my old bedroom. The bed seemed to have shrunk considerably since I was in it last. My feet hanging just over the edge of the mattress. Once I saved up a few bucks, I'd have to look into replacing the bed. I made a mental note to myself of making that one of my first priorities. It took me until the beginning of May before I was finally feeling settled in at both the old apartment and the new job. I even made the acquaintance of a couple of my neighbors in the building. There was an old black couple up on the fifth floor, Horace and Sophia Coogan. They were somewhere in the late 60s, real nice people. They had been living here for the longest time. When I mentioned to them that I was Maria's son, they said they remembered me as a small boy, even though I had no recollection of them. Either way, good people. Then there was a Puerto Rican girl on the floor below me, Lucinda Estevez. I never asked how old she was, as that's just something you never ask a woman, so I'd have to just guesstimate that she was somewhere in her late thirties. Beautiful woman, with olive-colored skin and long black hair and big dark eyes. I had run into her several times prior as we were getting mail from our mailboxes downstairs before I finally got up the nerve to start up a conversation. She lived alone and had moved in just over a year before me. As May was sliding by and summer was getting ready to make its scorching grand entrance into the ghettos of the Bronx, Horace asked me one day if I wouldn't mind looking at their car. He could only describe the problem with their old blue pinto as not running right. I felt obligated as a neighbor and a mechanic to take a gander beneath the hood and see what was cooking. It was during that overcast Saturday afternoon when I went out to the street with my toolbox that I first became aware of the night crawler. Old Horace must have felt a little guilty having me out there at the curb looking under the hood by myself. Or maybe Sophia had coaxed him out there to keep me company as I gave the engine a going over. He stood leaning against the car with his hands crammed in his pockets, gazing up at the neighboring apartment buildings that lined our street. Gonna be a hot summer, he stated to no one in particular as his eyes scanned the facades of the surrounding buildings. Uh-huh. Nightcrawler gonna have a grand old time this year. To who? I asked from under the hood as I was checking the spark plug tips. The Nightcrawler, he repeated nonchalantly. Your mama never told you about her? I can't say she ever did. Who is she? Some homeless lady. <laughs> Horace chuckled at my inquiry. No, I wish that was all she was. She come out every summer hoping to find some poor soul with the windows wide open on a hot summer night. His statement had drawn my curiosity, and I emerged from under the hood while still running a folded piece of sandpaper between a plug's electrode and arm. What? Horace turned his eyes from the urban landscape and faced me. Some folk think it's just some silly urban legend, but I seen it with my own two eyes, so I know better. You'll find none of my windows open at night during the summer. <laughs> no, sir, and I'd advise you to do the same. I was the one chuckling now. <laughs> what are you talking about? He leaned closer and lowered his tone slightly as a woman and her three kids passed us on the sidewalk. 
They say there's an old Haitian woman who lives here in the Bronx. Exactly where, I don't know, nor do I want to. Come over on the boat a long time ago. They say she's a mambo. Mambo? I now found myself leaning on the car next to him. The engine was a distant memory. A voodoo priestess. They say she's older than you, me, and Sophia all put together. She's still alive after all this time because of that night crawler. She sent it out on a summer night to suck the life out of people while they sleep. Then it crawls back to her before the sun rises and breathes the life of those folks into her. That will keep her alive for so long. I found the yarn that Horace was spinning as entertaining as it was captivating and went along with this fabricated story. So exactly what is this, uh, Nightcrawler? Well, to be honest, the Nightcrawler is what I call it. Its true name is Le Rodeur. Uh, Le... Le Ro... I struggled to repeat the foreign word. Le Rodeur. It's a French word. Means something that creeps or prowls around. Or something of the sort. Shit, I'm not French. That's why I call it the Nightcrawler. Anyway, this thing looks something like a big black spider. But it's not really a spider exactly. It has part of a woman mixed in there. Something that priestess called up from some hole in hell. A spider? Mixed with a woman? His imagination was without limits. Only way I can describe it. I didn't believe in all that bullshit voodoo mumbo-jumbo either, till I saw it myself. It was about five or six summers ago. I woke up in the middle of the night to take a piss. When you get old, you find yourself always having to piss. Anyway, as most folks do here in the summer who can't afford an air conditioner or the electric bill that come with it, they leave the windows wide open all night, hoping that some kind of breeze blows in during the night to offer a little relief from the heat while they're sleeping. I nodded as I listened. I recalled how my mother had always kept the windows wide open at night during the summer, even with one of those small isolating fans going all night long. I remember just lying there in the dark, spread eagle on the sheets and nothing but my skivvies trying to cool off from the stifling heat. Well, I was standing there in front of the john pissing and looking out the small window above it. At first I thought I was seeing things, but... After rubbing the sleep from my eyes, I found out I wasn't. I saw this giant spider crawling on the building across the way. It blended in with the night shadows and was as silent as the grave as it moved. I watched it scurry about along the side of the wall, checking each window it came upon. When it stopped at an open one, it crawled right into that apartment. Not sure how long I stood there at the john watching out the window, but it was some time long after I'd finished pissing when it came back out and crawled off to the back of the building. Later the next day, come to find out that Mr. Jackson was found dead in that apartment. I realized just how distracting this story had become and moved back to the engine. I didn't want to spend all afternoon under the hood on my Saturday. That was probably just a coincidence. Like you said, it was dark and there were shadows, and you had just awakened. A perfect combination to be seeing hallucinations. Hallucinations, my dick. I know what I saw. The thing was like some spider woman crawling about the sides of the buildings at night looking for an open window. So it can creep in and suck the life out of someone in their sleep. If you're smart, you'll take my- Horace! Sophia was calling down from their window five floors up. Come on up for lunch. Got soup and a sandwich waiting for you. Just keep your windows closed at night, George. At least until summer passes. With his parting words, Horace pulled himself from off the car and patted my shoulder as he shuffled into the building. As I was checking and cleaning the other spark plugs, I found myself still smiling at his urban legend and how seriously he took it. I thought about how hot their apartment must get in the summer at night, with only a small fan going and all the windows sealed because of one old superstitious man. I laughed out loud and shook my head as I continued with my task. Just like Horace had predicted that Saturday afternoon, summer had come early with a blazing introduction. 
The sweltering humidity seemed to linger all day, making the simple act of breathing a laborious effort, and still it mocked and defied you as it remained even in the dark of night. During the past couple of weeks I had become closer with Lucinda, and we saw more of one another other than outside of just bumping into each other at the mailbox. On a couple of occasions we even went out to a local bar down the street for a couple of beers. In that time we had become comfortable enough with each other to exchange apartment keys. Not that there was nothing serious going on between us, but we just trusted one another enough to hold on to each other's key just in case we got locked out. It was easier this way instead of waking up the building super late at night just to tell him you were locked out. It had been just over a month after we exchanged keys when it happened. I had come home late one Friday night from the garage, and the heat of that day just seemed to drain the strength from me. You know the feeling. All I wanted to do when I walked in that door was flop on the couch and knock back a few cold beers and watch some television. I eventually wound up calling Lucinda to see if she wanted to hang out and share a few drinks. Maybe even go down to the bar where there was air conditioning. But there was no answer at her place. Probably out on a date or with some friends. I decided to make the best of the evening and settled for some cold cores and back-to-back -back episodes of The Honeymooners. This episode of Drew Blood's Dark Tales is brought to you by BetterHelp. You ever zig when you should have zagged, me amigos? No, I don't mean like when making a left when you should have made a right, or ordering an extra cheese for your lactose intolerant date. I mean a real zig, like screwing up an important career move, or getting involved with the wrong people, or hooking up with that gassy gal in the first place. Trouble is, we don't always know what we want for our own futures. Without someone to help us identify our goals and stay focused on them, we tend to make poor decisions. One poor decision after another. And before you know it, you're sitting there wondering where it all went wrong. Well, that ends now, amigos. Because with BetterHelp Online Therapy, you're going to have a licensed professional therapist by your side from start to finish. Your days of thoughtless, unfocused decision-making are over. You're going to find out what you really want out of life, and you're going to get after it like Paul J. McSorley. Here's how to get started. First, you'll fill out a little questionnaire on their website so they can understand your needs. Less than 48 hours later, they'll have you matched with the perfect therapist. From then on, you can text anytime, whether you're having a crisis, need some quick advice, dinner recommendations, or anything at all. He or she will be right there in your pocket. You can schedule weekly audio or video chats, whichever you're more comfortable with. Since it's all remote, there's no need to be seen in person or on camera. And here's why I love therapy. Plain and simple, two heads are better than one. Life with a therapist at your disposal means twice the decision-making power. So here's my sincere advice to you, mi amigos. If you feel like you're flying by the seat of your pants, go ahead and reach down in them because most likely there's a phone in there. That, my dear friends, could be your access to a licensed professional therapist 24-7. Just picture the difference that could make in your life, whether you're dealing with decisions around career, relationships, or anything else. Therapy helps you keep focused on what you really want out of life so you can move forward with confidence and excitement. Let therapy be your map with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash DarkTales today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash DarkTales. Thanks for your support, amigos, and thanks for supporting our valuable sponsors. I couldn't tell you what time I had fallen asleep. One minute I was five beers in, watching Ralph and Norton preparing to buy a hot dog stand, and the next, I was sound asleep. Something, though, had awakened me from my clammy slumber sometime past midnight. 
I slowly opened my eyes and saw that there was nothing on the television now but static. The network was done for the night, and the apartment was dark. As I laid there on the couch with my clothes sticking to me with sweat, I debated if I should jump in the shower and try to cool off before I went to my bed for the rest of the night. Before I could come to any conclusion on the matter, the noise that had initially awakened me came again. A creaking of a floorboard. It came from the kitchen behind the couch. Now I had grown up in this apartment and knew it as well as one might an old close friend. I knew which windows leaked cold drafts in the winter, which wall sockets worked and which didn't, and especially what areas of the hardwood floor creaked when stepped upon. I gently closed my eyes and feigned sleep as I awaited my next move. The floor creaked again ever so slightly as pressure was placed on its surface. Someone had somehow managed to get into my apartment. I racked my brain for anything close at hand that I could use as a weapon. I strained on picturing a mental image of my surrounding area on the couch and I couldn't find nothing that would aid me in a fight. Empty beer cans and a TV remote weren't cutting the mustard. I thought if I were to perhaps suddenly fly off the couch screaming like some madman that it would give me the element of surprise and maybe even the upper hand but that notion was swept aside when I now felt the weight being applied to the couch itself. Was somebody climbing onto the couch with me? I slowly allowed my eyelids to part as I could no longer cluelessly lay there oblivious to what was taking place. I damn near screamed and pissed myself. Though my eyes were beholden what was squatting over me, my mind was mentally screaming that this could not be reality but a horrifying nightmare that I could not awaken from. The ghastly monstrosity was directly over me, balanced partially on both the couch and the floor. I instantly recognized it as some giant man-sized spider. Four of its long segmented legs were perched on the back of the couch while the other four rested on the floor between the TV and I. The foul creature was huge and black with splashes of gray mixed into its body, giving it superb camouflage for its nighttime patrols amongst the shadows. The most hideous aspect of this abomination was its head. Horace was indeed correct about it being a female. A human head was fixed where the spider's face should have been. A haggard looking gray face of a woman with long matted black hair that dangled about my face. The eyes in the ungodly face were a milky white. All four of them. Two more smaller eyes bulged from the forehead. The misshapen mouth was even more grotesque. Two small infant-like arms stretched from the sides of its neck and constantly moved about. Its tiny pointed fingers grasping at the air and its little hands playfully touching the creature's dripping maw. As I had said, I did not scream. I couldn't but I sure as hell pissed myself though. I was literally paralyzed with fear as I lay there in sweat and urine. The face loomed closer and the spider's sternum lowered itself onto me and I could now feel its weight. The tiny hands reached out and began to gently stroke my face as it was lining its mouth directly onto mine. I was about to have the life sucked out of me and they would find me sprawled out dead on the couch in the morning just like that Mr. Jackson fellow. George? Someone was calling my name outside my door and began knocking louder than one should. George, you up? I forgot my key. My God, not her. Please don't let it take her. I mentally cried as the sudden noise startled it, causing it to lift itself off me. The head turned towards the door as Lucinda called my name again and knocked. I'm going to come in and get my key, okay? I hope you're decent. I could hear her fumbling my spare key into the door's lock. The face turned back to meet mine, and the little hands again caressed my face. Soon. It spoke in a gurgled hiss, and in one quick movement, it was off both me and the couch. As the front door swung open, I heard it brush against the kitchen window frame on its way out rattling the glass pane as it passed through. 
Even as Lucinda walked in and saw me lying on the couch surrounded by beer cans and in my piss-stained pants, I still couldn't move. What I had just experienced was so surreal that my mind was still trying to sort through what had just happened when she looked down at me in disgust. Jesus Christ, George, what the fuck? Look at yourself, was all she said as she walked over to the wall and pulled her key off the nail it hung from. She looked down at me again, shook her head in disappointment and scoffed before she walked out. Still, I just laid there in a hot mess and in silence. I could only imagine the sight I must have been. It took me a good ten minutes to process everything that had occurred and chalked it up to something that was dreadfully real and not some baneful dream. When I finally accepted the ordeal as pure fact, I recalled the one word that thing spoke before it scurried back out the window. Soon. It was then I leapt from the couch and began closing and securing all the windows to the apartment, as well as closing all the shades. As the reality of my experience soaked in, my legs and hands began to shake. I reached into the cabinet above the sink and pulled out a bottle of the hard stuff. I must confess that I had never been so scared in all my life, and I turned on every light in the apartment, then sat at that kitchen table all night, pulling off that bottle until the sun rose. Only then did I move to my bedroom and succumb to a restless sleep. I awoke the next morning with the notion that last night's events were in no way accurate and just a far-off dream. The idea was almost accepted until I sat up, still in yesterday's clothes, and saw the front of my pants were still damp with piss. With it being daylight and the temperature already rising, I pulled myself from my bed and showered. The whole time I stood under the cool cascade of water, I tried to tell myself that it couldn't have been real. After changing into some fresh clothes, I finished what was left of the bottle and went up to see Horace. To my luck, Sophia had run out to do some food shopping, leaving Horace and myself alone for the time being. Before I could unload my experience onto him, he poured us each a shot of blackberry brandy. He said that by the look on my face, I needed it. It was after the third shot that I told him of last night's encounter. There were times where I stammered through my story, and at one point almost cried, but with much difficulty and two more shots of brandy, I finally concluded my tale. Hmm, uh, sound to me like that young girl said you asked last night, he finally said. It also sound like the nightcrawler isn't through with you yet. What do you mean? If that thing told you soon, what you think that means, huh? Sound to me like she's gonna be paying you another visit. But why? I was already starting to sweat despite the old box fan that was mounted in the window which was failing to blow any cool air into the room. You denied it a life, and you got a pretty good look at it, I guess. Only thing I can tell you, George, is you was one lucky motherfucker. And you owe that girl downstairs, even though she has no idea what she did. Yeah, I guess I do. I stood up and set the shot glass on an end table near my chair. I've got to get going, Horace. I'm still having a hard time swallowing all this. I need to do some thinking. Hmm. You do all the thinking you need to. And most of all, make sure your windows are locked up every night now. He also stood and walked me to the door. Every summer night since then, I closed and secured all the windows religiously. I didn't give a damn how hot it got in that tiny apartment. Those windows stayed shut. It took me the rest of that summer before I stopped closing my blinds at night. Eventually, my life began to slowly resume its normal day-to-day -day activities, and I started talking to Lucinda again. You see, after that night, she avoided me and had even given me back the key to my place. She must have thought I was some drunken vagrant after what she saw that night. I never mentioned what really happened, and never will. After that day up in Horace's apartment, I never spoke a word of it again, and Horace never brought up the subject. Sometimes over the last few summers, 
while I laid there in bed on those sweltering nights, laying spread eagle in my skivvies just as I had done as a child, I would catch a glimpse of some dark shadow moving quietly past one of my windows. I didn't try to summon up some reasonable explanation to the shape or begin to deny what was really out there crawling around, because I knew exactly what it was. Le Rodier, the Nightcrawler. During its late night prowling about the city, it was occasionally making a detour just to see if I had let down my guard and accidentally left a window open. Last summer, Horace passed away. No, not by the Nightcrawler. He still kept his windows closed every summer like clockwork. He had tripped carrying a bag of groceries up the steep stairs to his apartment. The poor bastard broke his neck in the fall. Killed him instantly, some say. I was at work when it occurred and found out from Lucinda later that day as we met at our mailboxes. A month later, Sophia moved away and was staying with family down in North Carolina. As for Lucinda, we gradually started hanging out once more and even exchanged keys again. The Lord taketh away and he giveth. Things were finally starting to fall back into a comfortable state of normality. I even spent some money I had stashed away for a new couch and bought an air conditioner for Lucinda. I never forgot what Horace had said about me owing that girl for her unexpected arrival that night and saving my ass from a horrible death. The least I could do was give her a reason to close her windows in summer. I think my gift won me major brownie points because we're going out next weekend for dinner. This relationship may just be ready to progress to the next level. I was coming home from that bar down the street where Lucinda and I used to frequent. Only this time I was out celebrating one of my co-workers' birthdays. All the guys from the garage were there. Despite the day's earlier heat, there was a slight breeze in the air that night and it felt good as I walked home. The pleasantry was short-lived though, as I entered my building and climbed the stairs to the third floor. I was sweating like a whore in church by the time I reached my door. As soon as I walked in and closed the door behind me, I could tell she had been in my apartment. Her perfume still lingered in the air as I walked into the darkened confines inside. The only light on was the overhead light above the stove. A folded piece of paper was neatly placed on the stove's surface. My name was written across it. I was already smiling as I unfolded the paper and read the handwritten note. George, I just wanted to tell you how much I appreciate the air conditioner and how much I appreciate you. We've really come a long way since you first moved in. To show you how much I appreciate your efforts, I bought a bottle of wine and will probably have started it by the time you read this. How about coming downstairs and helping me finish it? Lucinda. P.S. I opened a few of the windows to let some air in. There's a beautiful breeze out tonight. How you can have them closed all summer is beyond me. My smile faded as quickly as it had formed and the letter slipped from my fingers. I could only stare straight ahead as I heard something shifting in the room's darkness. It pushed aside a chair behind me as it was moving closer. A black shadow began to fall over me. I closed my eyes as tightly as possible. Finally! The gurgled hiss spat into my ear. This time, I did scream. And that was Open Windows by our pal Frederick Pangborn. A good reminder for all you metropolitan types that if the city air doesn't kill you, something else probably will. A little about the author. 
Frederick Pangborn is a short story horror author with just over 100 stories written, with the majority of them in publication. His two latest anthologies, Hellish Consequences and Dreamers of the Tomb, can be found on Amazon. A retired law enforcement officer and former U.S. Marine, he's happily retired in Florida. Thanks, Frederick. And do old Drew Blood a favor, would you? Subscribe to his podcast wherever you do your listening and leave him a five-star review and a kind word, even if you're listening on YouTube. To hear a premium ad-free edition of tonight's and all the other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click Patrons in the upper menu. You'll find yourself at chillintalesfordarknights.com, where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to their entire audio archive, all ad-free and available to download or stream. Thank you for your time and for supporting our sponsors. When you support our sponsors, you support this show. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all the latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with them each and every week. Oh, and you can find Drew Blood on Facebook and Instagram. The Drew Blood's Dark Tales podcast is accepting submissions, friend. If you've got a story or two you'd like to be featured on the show, send it to drewbloodhorror at gmail.com. If selected, you'll get the full treatment. Ten bananas. Well, I'm afraid this is where we part ways, friend. At least till next week. So grab a drink for the road. And hey, if you see any women walking around like a spider out there, don't be alarmed. That's just Agnes. She's unusual. This week, I'd like to say hello and thank you to a fan of the show. Mr. Nico Reed. What's happening, Nico? I really appreciate the comments, friend. Thank you. So, Mr. Nico Reed and all the other fans out there, may the wind be at your meat and may the road rise up to back you. Um, you meant what I knew. Join me next week for another illustrious holiday. Also, keep your ears open because in the next week or so, we're going to kick off our Patreon page. And until then, go fuck yourselves. (laughs) I love you. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.